Greetings and good morning, everybody. This is Chris Hislop. I am the executive director from the Montana World Affairs Council. Welcome to another session of Connect Montana, where we bring the world to Montana and Montana to the world. It is All Ireland Week here this week, as many of you know. We've had the pleasure of having the Irish Council General from San Francisco, Robert O'Driscoll, on Monday. Yesterday was Dr. Jonathan Westrup talking about the Irish economic renaissance and its impact on Montana. But not all of our shows have to be about current events, economics, and COVID-19. Um, the world is a rich and fantastic place full of wonderful cultural connections, of which Montana shares many with Ireland. And I'm very pleased today to have a good friend of mine, Gary German, on. Gary is a poet and playwright from Dublin. His show is Macklin, Method, and Madness, Allergic to Beckett, and My Life as a Chat Show Host have all received critical and popular acclaim, both in Ireland and abroad. He's a graduate of Trinity College, Dublin. Gary, over to you. Chris, thank you so much for that warm welcome. And I'm really excited to be taking part in Irish Week in Missoula, Montana. Uh, I know your aims uh, at the Montana World Affairs Council are to bring the world to Montana and Montana to the world. So today, Sandy Cove Dublin is in Missoula and uh, in this period of, of, of this dreadful period of lockdown through COVID-19, to be able to virtually share our experiences through your uh, wonderful facilities is fantastic. So uh, thank you so much for, for, for having me on board. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be involved and to bring a, a short talk that I'm going to give about one of my favorite poems, Easter 1916 by William Butler Yeats. The, the title of my talk is A Terrible Beauty is Born, Ireland Yeats and the Easter Rising. And a terrible beauty is born is a line that is repeated at the end of Yeats' wonderful poem. Um, I'm going to read the poem at the end, um, but I thought, Ireland, Yeats, the Easter Rising. I could speak not just for 15 minutes on the three, 15 minutes on all of them, or 15 hours on all of them, but where better to start than with Bob Dylan. Um, so Bob Dylan from Hibbing, Minnesota, who is a, a near neighbor of yours. He's only a thousand miles away, Chris. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I received a text from a friend of mine saying that Dylan had, had released a new song, Murder Most Foul, about the death of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, about JFK, JFK's assassination in Dallas in 1963. Um, and he described it as a gift to fans for their support and loyalty over the years. It's 16 minutes and 56 seconds long. Um, I went down to the sea, I had my headphones on and I listened to it. It's a political work, it's long, it has a litany of names, it's an elegy to the dead. And I, I, don't worry, I'm not going to sing any of Dylan's uh, song. I couldn't, obviously couldn't do that. But the final lines I'm just going to give you, Play marching through Georgia and Dumbarton's drums. Play darkness and death will come when it comes. Play love me or leave me by the great Bud Powell. Play the blood-stained banner. Play murder most foul. And straight away, I was back among school children. I was 12 years of age and I was hearing for the very first time Easter 1916 by William Butler Yeats. Another long poem, another uh, political work, a reaction by an artist to a, a tragic event. And Yeats, like Dylan, uh, is a Nobel laureate for literature. Um, when, I, uh, when I heard this work linking the death of JFK in 63, and the Easter Rising in 1916, I found these two events are really um, seminal events, the seminal events in Irish history in the 20th century. If you take the Easter Rising and the death of JFK, 
when Dylan ponders the death of JFK, he muses 50 years after his death, that it's the death of hope, uh, the youthfulness and promise of JFK, the new America that was emerging. In fact, in some ways, he's regretting the loss of the American dream. Now, this is something that Dr. Westrup covered in his excellent speech yesterday, because the ramifications of the death of JFK were not just American, they were global, but in particular in Ireland, because JFK was the first Irish American president. When Yeats writes uh, about, the, uh, uh, about Easter 1916, he strikes a slightly different note, because it's what, although he mentions death many times in the poem, it's one of birth rather than death. It's one of one of new life, the tree of liberty springing from this, this rising. Um, and just to point out, uh, because Easter is a movable feast, Easter in 1916 actually took place on the 24th of April. So that's this Friday. So we're very current uh, in terms of, uh, of this discussion. So I'm going to move now from Dallas to Dublin. And I'm, as I said, I'm going to read the poem, but I do want to put it in some context and, and by answering the following questions. What was the situation in Ireland in 1916? What, in fact, was the Easter Rising? What role did Yeats play in the Easter Rising? And why is his poem, Easter 1916, so highly regarded? So let's go to Ireland in 1916. It was part of the British Empire, and as such, it was at war. Britain were involved in the Great War with Germany, what is now the First World War. Now, British rule in Ireland had begun with the Anglo-Norman invasion in the late 12th century, so there were 700 years of occupation. In 1916, with Britain at war, over 200,000 Irish men and women were fighting in France and Belgium. And in fact, they were volunteers. They were willingly signed up because there was no cons conscription in Ireland. 31,000 Irish people died in the First World War. Now, back in Dublin, while the war was going on, the Irish Republican Brotherhood and the Irish Volunteers, which were Irish nationalists, they saw England's difficulty being Ireland's opportunity to strike. Now, before the war, Ireland had been promised uh, parliamentary home rule, which was a sort of devolved independence from the British Empire. But the, 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 this had been suspended because of the outbreak of the war. So what happened was the nationalists believed that Britain would renege on the promise of home rule. They wanted full independence, so they wanted a rebellion. And this is how the Easter Rising came about in April 1916. In the early morning of Easter Monday, April 24th, the Irish tricolour, green, white and orange, echoing the French tricolour of, of 1792, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternity. This was raised above the General Post Office in the centre of Dublin, the GPO, by several hundred armed nationalists. One of the leaders, Patrick Pierce, Porrick Pierce, read aloud the proclamation of the Irish Republic. And these words have echoed down through the last century of Irish history. In fact, historian Charles Townsend has described the proclamation as a kind of national poem, lucid, terse, and strangely moving, even to unbelievers. Now the revolution, the rising, was led by a collection of poets, communists, trade union leaders, extremely committed and brave, but no match for the British forces. In fact, the rising was poorly planned, poorly executed, and due to poor communication, it did not spread outside Dublin. It was really mainly a Dublin phenomenon. There were almost 500 people killed in Easter week. Approximately half of them were innocent civilians. Now, as I mentioned before, Ireland was at war. 
So many Ireland Irish families, many Dublin families had husbands, fathers, sons fighting in the trenches in the British Army. And these families would have been at best ambivalent to the Easter Rising. This is brilliantly covered in a book by Sebastian Barry uh, called A Long, Long Way that I urge, urge you all to read. It's a, it, it really describes um, the nationalism and, and the empire in 1916. So what happened was, um, the, the, it was not particularly well received. The Rising was not particularly well received by the people of Dublin and they saw their city reduced to rubble. But public opinion was to change dramatically after the Rising. So what happened in the aftermath of the Rising? Well, the military campaign was a failure, but the swift e execution by the British forces in the following two to three weeks of 16 of the, 15 of the, of the, of the leaders of the, of the Rising, they were shot by firing squad. And as the news of the gallantry and bravery with which these, the leaders met their deaths, public opinion turned and they became heroes. And the blood sacrifice, which has long played a part in Irish myth mythology and martyrdom, um, that came and started an unstoppable drive towards full independence not just for Ireland in 1922, but for many other countries in the British Empire. It started a landslide of countries looking for independence. The tree of liberty had been planted. So what role did Yeats play in the Easter Rising? Well, Yeats did not fight in 1916. As I said, there were poets who did fight and die, of the seven signatories of the proclamation, three were poets, Porrick Pierce, Joseph Mary Plunkett, and Thomas McDonough. But Yeats was not one of them. He was a romantic literary revolutionary or nationalist rather than an insurrectionist. In fact, while the rising took place, he was in England and he learned of the developments through sketchy news reports and the letters from his friends and family. And although Yeats came from a Protestant Anglo-Irish background, he, was, he had staunchly affirmed his Irish nationality and was a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. The Rising had a huge impact on him. He said, I had no idea that any public event could so deeply move me. And in the wake of the courts martials and executions, in May 1916, he wrote to Lady Gregory that he was trying to write a poem. Together, Lady Gregory and himself had founded the Abbey Theatre in 1904. And uh, Yeats had written a play in 1902 called Kathleen Nee Houlihan, which had an, a major influence as part of the Anglo-Irish literary revival. In fact, in 1938, Yeats wrote, looking back at this, did that play of mine send out certain men the English shot? So the role of cultural nationalism had a major impact on the revolutionaries of, of, of 1916 and onwards. So now I want to read this poem, uh, Easter 1916. Uh, it's it's a, a four stanzas that Yeats completed in September 1916, he kept it private. He did not want the British forces to find out about it because he was trying to negotiate um, paintings which had been left uh, by Hugh Lane to the National Gallery or to the Hugh Lane Gallery in, our, in, in Dublin were taken by the National Gallery in London. And Yeats did not want uh, to get involved politically with the British government at this, at, at this point in time. So the poem only became public in 1921, five years after the rising, when it was published in a collection called Michael Ro Roberts and the Dancer. But it's, it's a real pleasure to have this opportunity to read this poem to you today. 
uh, Easter 1916 by William Butler Yeats. I have met them at close of day, coming with vivid faces from counter or desk among grey 18th century houses. I have passed with a nod of the head or polite meaningless words, or have lingered a while and said polite meaningless words, and thought before I had done of a mocking tale or a jibe to please a companion around the fire at the club, being certain that they and I but lived where motley is worn. All changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. That women, woman's days were spent in ignorant goodwill, her nights in argument until her voice grew shrill. What voice more sweet than hers when young and beautiful she rode to harriers? This man had kept a school and rode our winged horse. This other, his helper and friend, was coming into his force. He might have won fame in the end, so sensitive his nature seemed, so daring and sweet his thought. This other man, I had dreamed a drunken, vainglorious lout. He had done most bitter wrong to some who are near my heart, yet I number him in the song. He too has resigned his part in the casual comedy. He too has been changed in his turn, transformed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Hearts with one purpose alone through summer and winter seem enchanted to a stone to trouble the living stream. The horse that comes from the road, the rider, the birds that range from cloud to tumbling cloud, minute by minute they change. A shadow of cloud on the stream changes minute by minute. A horse hoof slides on the brim and a horse plashes within it. The long leg moor hens dive and hens to moorcocks call. Minute by minute they live, the stones in the midst of all. Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. Oh, when may it suffice? That is heaven's part, our part to murmur name upon name as a mother names her child when sleep at last has come on limbs that had run wild. What is it but nightfall? No, no, not night, but death. Was it needless death after all? For England may keep faith for all that is done and said. We know their dream, enough to know that they dreamed and are dead. And what if excess of love bewildered them till they died? I write it out in verse. Macdonough and Macbride and Connolly and Pierce, now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Thank you very much. Um, and maybe just to conclude, Chris, and before I hand over to you, uh, uh, seven years later, Yeats won the Nobel Prize for Literature and it was awarded to him on the basis by the Nobel Committee for his always inspired poetry, which in a highly artistic form gives expression to the spirit of a whole nation. And that's, uh, I, I suppose, describes perfectly how Yeats is regarded. So thank you so much for uh, allowing me this time to, uh, to talk to you today and to, uh, to read Easter 1916. Thank you, Chris. Gary, that was just such a beautifully rich description um, of the situation and a lovely reading of, of really an amazing and deeply touching poem. So thank you for that. Um, let me just kick off with a, a question to you, Gary. Uh, we have just a few minutes now for some Q&A. Um, over and over, Yeats is talking about change and transformation. 
you know, and, and when we're talking about birth or Yates is talking about birth, it's a transformation, but into something unknown. You know, when something is born, we don't know what the future holds. We're, you know, there's uncertainty related to change and transformation in general, but the birth as such is a radical uh, unknown. Can you give us some insight into what Yeats might have been thinking was coming for the future of Ireland and, and what in fact did come? That's a great question, Chris. I think Yeats was fearful for the future. Um, and when, uh, when, when I, I said earlier, he was the, the, the quote that he gave in the wake of the killings was, um, I, 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 I'm, he said, I want to write a poem. I can't believe I have been as deeply moved by a public event uh, uh, as is the case. But he also followed that by saying, I'm very fearful for the future. Now, I think that the oxymoron of a terrible beauty, what, what Yeats realized was that through this rising, a Pandora's box had been opened. The British Empire now uh, was being challenged by Irish nationalism. And within six years following the rising, there was uh, a war of independence against Britain. There was uh, independence from Britain. And there then was a civil war between the people who had fought for independence. Now, this happens often in, in countries that look for independence uh, and, and then find themselves free from the the oppression of the tyrant or the colonial power. But this, um, this blood, uh, blood soaked tide was how Yeats described it. So he was very fearful for it. However, what happened in the wake of the Civil War, Civil War lasted about a year. From 1924 onwards, um, the Irish Free State established itself. And by 19... 33, when um, there was a change of government, there was not a coup d'etat, it was a, a smooth transition to, an, to, to a democracy. So I, I think Yeats himself then served as a senator in the Irish government and was very proud of the fact that he represented uh, the, the Anglo-Irish minority in the, in, in the Senate. But ultimately, uh, what Yeats foresaw was I think a bloody period whereby Ireland would 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 get its freedom and then establish its place among the nations of the world. Gary, here is a question coming in from one of our participants. Yeats mentions some people in the early sections of the poem, but doesn't name them. Who are they and what role did they play in the rising? Okay, well, this is a, 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 a very good question. In, in the second, the first stanza, Yeats establishes himself as a modernist poet, describing uh, the urban uh, metropolis that is Dublin and meeting people in Dublin, the vivid faces coming from counter or desk. In the second stanza, he is much more specific about people. They're not symbolic people, they are real people. So when he describes uh, that woman, um, that, that, that woman, uh, let me just get it there so as I have it. Yeah, that woman's days were spent in ignorant goodwill, her nights in argument until her voice grew shrill. He's actually describing Constance Gore Booth or Countess Marge Markovich. She married a Polish count. Countess Markovich, who was one of the leaders of the rising. And she also was from the Anglo-Irish uh, um, ascendancy, but played her part as a, an Irish nationalist um, in in the in the in the rising, and she was a friend, a close friend of Yeats, and had grown up with him in Sligo. When he talks of this uh, this man uh, who rode our winged horse, he's talking of Porrick Pierce there, who was a school teacher, and he also talks about his helper and friend, uh, and that's the poet Thomas Macdonough. They wouldn't have been friends of Yeats, but he reevaluated his respect for them in the wake of the, the, the rising. He also talks of that drunken, vainglorious lout who was Major, Ma Major John McBride, who was a British Army Major from the Boer War, who married the love of Yeats' life. 
that is Maud Gone McBride, who actually played Countess uh, or C Kathleen Nee Houlihan and the Countess Kathleen in Yeats' early plays in the Abbey Theatre. I mentioned them earlier. So uh, Yeats, Yeats also um, mentions him in, he says, I number him in the song because he reevaluates the commitment and the bravery and the gallantry that they showed uh, in the action that they took in Easter week. Gary, you're so right in saying that we could go on for hours and, and surely people have devoted entire lifetimes to Yeats's work and, and this poem. Um, but sadly, um, in this day and age, we don't have um, more than 25 minutes. So I want to thank you so much for um, coming on the show and talking about this poem. I want to give the last word to you, Gary. Chris, I, this is what I want to say. There, this time tomorrow, half four tomorrow, John Reynolds is going to talk about another great Irish poet and balladeer, and that is uh, Christy Moore. And Christy has adapted a number of Yeats poems, including the Song of Wandering Angus and Down by the Sally Gardens. So I'm wondering, will John allude to, uh, to those in his presentation tomorrow? Chris, I want to finish by saying, I never knew so much about Missoula, how rich a literary history, it, uh, a part it plays in history. Because on Sunday morning, I picked down On the Road by Jack Kerouac. I was to lend it to my son, who was going to have a, a look at it. And it says, there's a cowboy speaking, he says, I hate this damn place more than any place in the world. Montana's my home now. Missoula, you come up there sometime, come up to Missoula, and you'll see God's country. So I know this has been a virtual experience for all of us. Chris, I'm hoping someday I'll get over to Missoula to see God's country. Thank you so much. Gary, your invitation is always open, of course. Please come and visit us anytime you like. Thank you again for that. So uh, thanks to all the participants for joining us again today. Keep in mind that we've had uh, two guests Monday, Tuesday. If you missed those shows, you can find them on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook feed, as Gary's show will also be posted there shortly. Gary mentioned that tomorrow's guest is John Reynolds. John is going to be talking about Christy Moore, an Irish treasure, a singer-songwriter, uh, poet, and, and uh, uh, he's going to be talking about the wonderful breadth um, uh, of Christy Moore's um, life and its meaning in Irish culture and connecting it back to Montana and Montanans. Friday, we have Elaine Coughlin, who is a venture capitalist, who's talking about investment opportunities post-COVID-19 between the United States and Ireland. So you don't want to miss these shows. Um, they are on again at 9.30 a.m. Mountain Time, Thursday and Friday. And that is all for us here on Connect Montana today. Thank you all for joining. Have a good day.